my face. So welcome, everybody. I appreciate you guys coming today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about AWS um, account management in particular. Um, it, some of these things are actually going to be useful for you on the Google side and Azure side, possibly, depending upon how they do their, their account management. But one of the things we'll talk about today is, or actually several things we'll talk about today, is what is the, the best practice for how you do accounts in, in situations where you've got a large number of, of resources, users, and things of that nature in an, uh, an AWS implementation. Um, we'll go through some of the best practices that we have, uh, that AWS has, and talk about the pluses and minuses of them as well. Um, but the first thing to start with is, one thing I've found in a lot of clients that I deal with is that they don't really take account management into consideration when they start talking about what the architecture is going to be. We talk about, oh, let's, we're going to do some SQS over here, queues and databases and server lists and Lambda and, and all these different things. That ends up becoming the, the big architecture discussion that everybody has. <clears throat> but one of the most basic ones to have is actually how do you do your account management? And why you wouldn't think that that necessarily comes into play, because how often do you think about your GitHub account management, right? I mean, it's not that, that big of a deal. Once you hook everybody up, everybody has access to the same repos, uh, and you just go forward from there. But in, in, in AWS, it's a little bit more of a, a core asset for, for your company. Um, so it is a, definitely an impact on some of the decisions you make. So if you decide to go in one big account, you may architect your applications a specific way. If you decide to have accounts for individual environments, you do it another way. If everybody has their own account, each application considering uh, as well, then you're going to have it a completely different uh, way as well. So from the first thing that to think about is, we'll talk about this today, is think of your account as a physical boundary. So just like you would have a firewall or a DMZ, those types of things, it's, think of it as a way to physically block access to the, uh, the assets and things that you have in your environment. Um, if you have a house, like most people do have a house, I'm assuming, um, you've got different rooms, and each different room can have a different decor. It's got uh, doors to get into it, windows to get into it. Uh, maybe you've got different temperature controls for it, whatever the case may be, if you live in a big mansion. Um, same kind of thing from an account perspective. You have different rooms inside of your, your organization that will rep be represented by different accounts. Um, and if you're, if you're a, a nerd uh, like, like I am to an extent, and my son is to an extent, the, the, the membranes of the universe also, with the, the laws of physics are, are one thing in yours, but gravity is completely different than another one. <clears throat> So to go along with that, and I wish my pointer was working the way that I wanted it to work. I don't know if you guys can see. Yeah, you can. Um, the, the piece up there with the green box in it essentially is in the entire frame of converting something over from on-prem or from another cloud into AWS or any kind of cloud migration is done with a process like this. And on the left-hand side, you're doing some of the boring stuff, right? Your readiness and your planning, uh, things of that nature. And you're doing activation, and then you're going through your execution, and then you optimize it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go forward. But that little green box up there is what Amazon's got set up for how are you going to do your accounts. So before you actually start slinging code around, migrating machines over VMs and whatnot, you've got to figure out how you're going to set them up. Now, you don't have to do this. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, I never did it. And a lot of companies are still not doing it to this day. But when we go through and talk about this, you'll see some of the reasons why they'll actually help you to do, uh, give some consideration in that, that green box before you get started. I would say, okay, so best practices. Things that Amazon says that you should do, um, and hopefully these kind of bear out as far as some of the organizations that uh, they're also doing them. Um, one thing to note, these are options. They're not prescriptions. It's not a matter of do all the things. It's do the things that make, make sense for your organization, just like anything else. All right, so multiple accounts. Um, number one, why? My favorite one of this is Blast Radius, which is why I gave it the, uh, the, the nice big uh, marquee up there, is when something goes wrong, and for those of you who have been on my project, something's always going to go wrong, um, you want to limit the amount of Blast Radius you have from that. So when you tank something, you tank an entire, uh, entire database, for example, who's it going to impact? If you have smaller accounts, then it's only going to affect people in that particular account as opposed to the entire organization. Um, as a very pertinent, and it is my project, but it was not my fault, <clears throat> um, this last week, we actually had somebody that blew the network up for a, an on-prem cloud that we were building in OpenStack, and it basically shut down all the developers for the entire day while we went through and had to rebuild the entire thing. Um, had we had a different situation, we might have been able to mitigate some of that. Uh, the same thing with people's VMs, which just all of a sudden just start disappearing. Um, in the, the organization I'm working with up north, um, actually, I almost said that, that land up north, is that what it's called? Um, 
they are actually a situation where people's VMs were mis disappearing because somebody was deleting one that they thought was theirs, but it was not. So every time it get reinstantiated, they would delete it. So the guy was going around crazy all day. He's like, where does my VM keep going? So if you had separate accounts, things like that would be mitigated. Um, in AWS land, this would not necessarily be in, in Azure or, or Google or, or any other uh, cloud environment. Um, there's hard limits on things that you can do with a sp specific account, as far as, in this case, number of EC2 instances you can have. So if you actually spread that out as far as multiple accounts, then that, li that limit is reset for each one of those accounts. And the example is given is like, hey, I'm, I'm rolling this thing into production, and I've got a 50 EC2 limit max on this thing. I've built this thing, and all of a sudden it, goes, it tanks. Why does it tank? It's because I've got 50, you know, 55 of these things. If you break up your, your accounts, then you kind of reset those limits and give yourself a little bit more flexibility. Um, just like in everything else we deal with, separations of concerns and costs, that's just a good way to kind of keep the things that need to be kept together together and the things that need to be kept apart apart. Um, resource pollution. Um, <laughs> who's, who's had to go into an AWS environment and all of a sudden there's 300 queues in there and you can't find yours? So the first thing you do is like, well, I, just made, I was creating another one and maybe name it a little bit different. Um, that kind of goes away because you constrict the number of resources you need to have because you're only dealing with the specific problem being solved by that account. Um, arguably more simple security, um, by virtue of the fact if you have access to my account, then you should have access to the resources in that account. So I can do a bit more gross manipulation of security settings as opposed to having to, to tweak a lot of things internally. Um, opportunities for playgrounds and sandboxes, and then also I can mimic my distributed cloud architecture with my account architecture. And then my local environment becomes a little bit more simple to manage. Now the flip side of that, is some of the things that go along with it. It doesn't keep me from doing something stupid. I mean, I can still be boneheaded and get rid of my customer master uh, within my account. Hopefully my blast radius keeps that from happening. But the, uh, the top graphic up there is your, your developer does something that just basically blows everybody out of the water, whereas the one down below, uh, they pretty much kept the, uh, the destruction to their, their local domain. Um, because you've complexified your environment, you've now got a lot more connections in between them. So my interstitial pieces are going to be possible weakness points. So if something goes down, then I can take the things that all connect to it down as well. Um, but you would probably have that in a connected environment model of the situation anyway. And then also my overall management becomes more complex. So just like distributed development and then architectures themselves are more complex as you get smaller pieces, the, your account will be the same way. I've got much smaller accounts that have a lot more connections into them, but uh, it's, it, I have to trade off as to how much it's going to take for me to actually manage them versus the, uh, the, the, the benefit that they bring. Now hopefully, and that's what we're going to talk about, Amazon's tools for managing these things is going to help. So if and when you decide that you're going to go single, single account, the question then becomes is, all right, or to multiple accounts, sorry, how granular do I want to get with that? And what is the strategy by which I'm going to kind of create these? It's going to be different for every one of you guys uh, as far as I want to do it based upon um, the applications I've got. I want to do it based upon my traditional um, dev, QA, prod environments, those types of things. Um, it's how, as far as how you do it, or are you going to get it down to the application level? You could even do that. And then within the application level, dev, prod, pre-prod, that type of thing. So that's a discussion that ends up having to be uh, uh, work, uh, workplace by workplace. So the first one we'll talk about is probably the, one of the oldest things that, that AWS has had in place, and that would be organizations. Um, have you guys ever had to play with organizations before? A couple of y'all. <clears throat> organizations is essentially, it's a, a very logical way of, of setting up people that have access to AWS. So for an example, in our office, um, we have uh, the global one that we have for the entire company. And then for each, underneath that, each business unit, each city has their own. And then within that, we can further subdivide it into additional groups. You could do it on the prod, QA, whatever you want to do. Um, the example that I have for what I was building for this, uh, this presentation is I did a, uh, I don't know if you guys can read that or not, but essentially it's uh, a set of uh, conferences, Star Trek, uh, Code Mash, and Strange Loop, and then you could actually give accounts underneath each one of those for participants and for speakers and so forth. It's just, again, it's just a very logical way to set this up. So what it gives me is a, a way to kind of hierarchically organize the roles and people that I have in this, and it's, it's, this is free, this is, comes with every, uh, every account. The, um, the, the biggest thing, though, is the consolidated building. That's what traditionally most people have dealt with here. So everything that goes up in here, I can now start figuring out who owes what for what particular project, what particular person, what particular team, uh, where they may be. And that's how it kind of started out, is we needed a way to kind of consolidate my building so that I can get all these people in here rolled up underneath one account 
so we don't have to manage everybody's individual credit cards or uh, purchase accounts or whatever else the case may be. I want to roll them up into a single unit, and that's kind of where the organization has kind of came into play. Since then, they've actually kind of expanded it to the point now where I can actually have it make it be functional. So if I want to, to give everybody um, in a specific location or a specific project specific access to, say, S3 um, or queuing or Lambda or whatever else it wants to be, I can do that from here and actually make it through in a little bit easier way to deal with than actually going through the, the, main, um, the main interface. So permission guardrails and creation of accounts and, and all these types of things all come into play here. Um, a quick example would be, and again, I, I apologize if it's a, a little bit of an eye chart, but um, on the, the right-hand side, or on the, the left-hand side, I've got a, uh, an account um, in the, uh, the participants group uh, for Joe Bishop, um, one of my favorite guys, and I've decided this person needs, no longer needs to have access to SNS. So on the side, you can actually see there's a hierarchical thing where they've been given full access by the entire uh, organization, but I'm stripping uh, SNS access away for participants, and that's, this person is going to be uh, involved with that. So this is without going into the AWS interface and going through navigating all the, the tools. I just come in here to the user and say this person is now no longer going to have access to this, or this group, or whatever. And then when I flip back over to, uh, to actually try to create a channel, um, then I get the, the big red error saying that you have been denied this, this kind of access. So it's just a quick way to do it for an entire team or for an entire organization, however you want to do it. In addition to that, um, I can work with artifacts, configs, directory services, single sign-on, licenses, and so forth, all kind of be dealt with here within the organization side. Now, the, the thing to remember, though, is on the other side, when you go back into the individual tools, on this is the particular one is for configs, I believe, I have to go in here and actually specify and say, all right, I'm going to allow organizations to manage this particular function for me as well. So that kind of creates that two-way street uh, that I've got there. And as I said, the, the big one was consolidated billing. Um, for those of you that uh, have never had to play with it, that's probably the, the biggest thing in here. Even if you're doing sole things for yourself um, or for smaller engagements or small, smaller clients, uh, this is a good place to come in and create a separate project for, or a separate account for each of your projects. And then essentially come in here and say, all right, I'm going to organize them up. When I get my bill at the end of the month, then I know how much I need to bill back to project A versus project B versus project C. The, uh, the downside of this is it's the, uh, the last point up here, it would be nice if this actually took into account the organizational units. So if I had a logical view over, say, purchasing, I could actually say, purchasing, here's your stuff. I could probably still do it through tagging, uh, but it'd be easier if I could do it through that particular interface. All right. The bulk of today's discussion is thing, something called landing zone. Who has heard of landing zone? One, two, maybe, maybe three people. I'm not surprised, and I'll tell you why when we get into it. Um, so if Amazon says we need to have a, a multi-account posture in here, how are they going to let us do that or deal with that? Because as you can tell, I mean, if you had a, a small client and you had an account for them and an account for another client, that's great. Two accounts is easy to manage, but if you've got 2,000, it becomes a problem. So what is it? Landing zone is essentially a, a set of scripts, uh, CloudFormation scripts. It allows you to quickly set up a multi-account um, infrastructure, which we'll go into here in a little bit, and hooks in all the piping and, and, and connections and rules and all the things that need to go into place in order to enforce your, your company's um, standards and security and access and the things that go along with that. Um, by default, it does some things that we'll discuss, but for the most part, it allows you to do, basically build everything the way your company is set up to run and do it in a very quick, in, 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 uh, very quick manner to do so. Uh, it also provides a baseline environment then, so when you start creating accounts on top of these new base accounts, that those accounts will inherit, for lack of a better term, um, those same types of considerations as far as security, organization, access, and so forth. Uh, it's a very quick way to give somebody access to this, especially if you've got projects that are starting all the time, people are coming on board all the time that need to be onboarded, um, and they can come and get, get to work right away. The current version is version two. Uh, it was announced at the last reInvent, and the, the initial version was the year before at reInvent. Um, now, this is not an official service. If you go out to Amazon's page and say, uh, well, I'm going to do my landing zone, it's not going to be there. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a, it's a hidden service. It's, it's public available, but it's, it's, very, it's somewhat hidden. And again, we'll get into that uh, in just a second as to why that actually is. So when you, when you launch it, these are the things that actually takes into play. So what it ends up becoming is 
It's a script that takes into account all of these and several more, uh, these types of services that come into play. Uh, it goes out and it creates configuration rules. It uses code build to actually pipe the code through it. It uses Lambda, uh, Simple DB, S3. All these things come into play in actually creating these base accounts and governing them going forward. So when you go from a very, very sparse, brand new account and you say, I'm gonna launch this thing, all of a sudden now you've got all these assets and resources that have been allocated to your particular account. Um, the ones that are bolded up here actually come into uh, a little bit of dollars. And we'll, again, we'll discuss that a little bit when we get into it. Most of the other ones, are, we're talking about cents and pennies and zero, you know, zero dollars. Um, but there is a cost associated with doing this, not with the landing zone itself, but with the things that you instantiate because of it. So, and when we get back into how we actually deploy these things, and again, it, it's more on the left-hand side we plan, on the right-hand side we do. In the middle, and this is an estimate that, that Amazon's put out there as far as two to six months. And the one in the, uh, the eight little things up in the, uh, in the box up there, the second one from the left on the top one is landing zone. So all these things are going on, and this is also where you're preparing how your accounts are going to be set up, uh, the configurations you need to have, the rules you need to follow, and the actual writing of the code in order to do it or the modifying of the code. Um, so that's where this kind of play comes into play. You can run it when you, after you have things, but you're, you're going to have to get things kind of whipped into, uh, into shape in order to make it, make it useful. You probably end up having to do migrations from one account to another. So what does it look like? Conceptually, when you just launch Landing Zone right from the, right the, uh, the get-go, you're gonna get four accounts. You're gonna have an organization account, which is the main account when you log into, but you're actually logged into currently when you run this thing. And it's going to go through, and it's gonna spawn out three more accounts. Uh, a shared services account, a logging account, and a security account. And when it gets done, this is what you've got set up. All the connections you'll see um, are all there as well. So for the organization account, which is your primary one, um, basically it's just managing configure access to all the different landing zone accounts. Uh, the financials, the member accounts, all the S3 buckets, all the source code for it, the code pipeline for running it. Basically this is, becomes the management for your entire landing zone at this point. And the default VPC is removed. So it's, it's pretty much, nobody has access to this except for the primary person setting it up. This is the, uh, the organization, the governor for, for everything else. The next one is the shared services account. Um, it has access to your data center, and it also af operates as your centrally uh, LDAP, or your uh, Active Directory, uh, whatever your SSO is as well. Um, all the golden AM AMIs will be here. Centralized monitoring, uh, DNS will be here, and it's also got limited access. So the only thing that's gonna have access to it are a few people, but then also you'll be granted through roles access to your applications and whatnot to, to use it. And again, the default VPC is removed automatically. Um, the next piece is the logging, and this is essentially, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a company and, and they're trying to struggle and trying to build a, a global logging system for their, for their enterprise, um, and that's what the, the goal of this one is, is all, all logs will then end up becoming dumped into this location here. All the security is already all set, um, and all the access for any new uh, accounts that are built in can automatically point to this as a logging piece and utilize this as that global logging solution. Um, there's some tweaks you can do to it if you wanted to use, say, like, for example, an Elk Stack or Splunk or something like that. Um, that kind of ratchets up your cost a little bit, and you have to do a little bit of modifications. But for the most part, for bu using built-in stuff and logging at a global scale, this one is, is set up for you automatically. And then security kind of works the same way. Um, all your cross-account rules, um, the different configs for what you're allowed to do as far as encryption, um, publicly accessible things, like th things of that nature, are all done here in the security account. So when you're said and done, this is what you've got. You've got the ability to set these core accounts up and then utilize them for all the accounts you create next, which are the non-core accounts. So from a non-core perspective, um, what this is is essentially it's in the upper left-hand corner, you've got your core ones that we just created. Now I've got all my environments. So my application environments, my, my sandboxes, um, anything else that's essentially not part of the, the main core that I've set up feeds into that. So when I go out and create a new account, say for example, a, a, a new developer comes in and I wanna give them access to play with a few things, I can create them a sandbox account that's not really connected to anything with the exception of maybe SSO, that they can go in and say, they can start building some things and I can put on some, some limits on their, their costing, um, the expenses they have, and then they can actually go through and start playing around. Um, same thing with the, uh, the development environments and, and the other environments as, as well. They're connected automatically to all the things they need to have and they're not connected to things they don't. Um, and plus they're segmented from each other as well, so you don't have to worry about bleed over from, from dev into prod uh, or from QA into prod because you can actually manage that specifically through pipelines or whatever else your SDLC is. 
So uh, as I mentioned, for developer sandboxes, it's not connected to the data center. Um, you get innovation space, space, fixed spending limit, and um, automated creation destruction. So as you, you ask for it, you get it, you want to destroy it, it goes away. Nobody cares, you just throw it away. Um, for your pre-prod environments, it is connected to the data center, so you can actually move data back and forth to it as necessary. Um, and then you can build it based upon the, the isolation levels you need. So if you want to run all your projects through the same account and have them have, they share their own pre-prod and QA and development pipelines, sure you could do that. If you have digital accounts that are web-based and you have um, basically, uh, for lack of a better term, mainframe accounts or um, Java stuff, uh, sorry, if I if equated Java and mainframe together, I didn't mean to do that, so my apologies. Um, but you can also have different, different pipelines have different needs, therefore you can have different accounts that account for those, those types of operations. Um, in addition to that, automated deployments as you normally would have, and you just choose your granular, granularity like I mentioned as far as how, do I, how many different accounts do I wanna have. At this point, there's, there's not really any overhead for it, it's just a matter of do they need to talk to each other and do they have different reasons for being um, security or otherwise. And then you have your production environment which obviously is connected to the data center uh, things are promoted from pre-prod and limited access, automated deployment. So it's just like a regular environment, and again, you kind of can figure out what kind of granularity do you need to have. Does these applications run in this prod environment, and you have another prod environment for these over here? Uh, are databases kept separate? Those types of things are all decisions that you end up able to make. Um, they just have to go into the consideration of when you start building your environment, how you're going to configure those. And then lastly, just your regular dev environments uh, will work the same way. All right, so as an offshoot of Landing Zone, and this is the part that actually kind of got my interest when, when they first announced it a year and a half ago, is the, the account vending machines. Um, one of the things I was responsible for was uh, every time we hired a new person that needed to have access to, to AWS, is I'd get a call and say, hey Bill, since you're the one that controls the, the keys to AWS, can you give this person access? Um, and there was always a lot of questions that needed to be asked that answers never were provided. So I was like, all right, does this person have a name? What's their email address? What, what kind of things they need to have access to and not? Um, so when I saw this, it's come across the, uh, the announcement feed from Amazon. It's like, this is great. Um, and it is pretty cool, but it's gonna take more work than, unless you've got high-end needs, um, more than I did as far as creating a couple of people you know, a month. Um, if you have high-end needs, then, um, then you, that was me. I was knocking on, on my, my mic. Um, go, go let him in. Um, so if you have, have high-end needs, and this is gonna be a, uh, a savior for you. Essentially what it is, and I, I did have a picture of a, a Coke machine up here, uh, but I didn't wanna violate any kind of, uh, any kind of you know, copyright situations and, and give Coke some free advertising, but essentially that's what it is. You ask it for an account, and it gives you an account based upon the rules that you, you specify and, and based upon the baselines that have already been established by Landing Zone. So there is an account uh, creation UI such that it is, and, and I'll show you a picture of it. Um, it's got some baseline versioning for basically starting up the, the thing from scratch and anytime any kind of changes are made by Amazon or by anybody else, then that account will automatically inherit those, those new rules. Um, launch constraints, what they're allowed to run, um, create and update their own account, they can do that. Applies the network baseline and the security baseline and again it removes the default VPC. So, control tower. So everything I just told you over the last 24 minutes and five, six, seven seconds, um, you can kind of throw out a little bit. I mean, it's still valid, it still works that same way and so forth. This is what people are waiting for. And part of the reason is, and I'll, I'll tell you why as we get to, I can tell you what this is first, is that um, Control Tower is supposed to be the UI that, that governs everything then within Landing Zone. And this is the one, if you actually go out to AWS and look at now and say, give me a list of the services and, and pull up Control Tower, it will be there. Um, and essentially what it is, is everything that you would possibly want to be able to manage your accounts without having to go through and mess with all of the, the, uh, the CloudFormation things in order to make it work. Uh, there's still a lot, fair amount of that, but for the most part, it gives you a GUI over landing zone, uh, the organizations, and vending machine, it kind of ties them all together, plus it gives you a dashboard, so if somebody goes out of compliance, you'll see that uh, very quickly. So it's effectively just a, a level of abstraction over what the existing tool sets are. Um, it creates all the AWS tech underneath, so all that still works the same. It's essentially just a, a nice shiny gooey cover for it. Uh, it's in limited beta now, and I tried to get access to it, but they said no. 
Um, the beta is currently full. I'd like to have shown you a picture of it, but that is the official icon, as ominous looking as it is. Um, but uh, effectively, that's what it does, is it just basically sits over the top of, of landing zone. Now, uh, a couple of use cases. We'll go through these and, and take a look at it real quick as far as um, how, what it looks like and how it kind of works. So for landing zone itself, <coughs> the, uh, the first thing is you gotta find the script. So as I mentioned, you couldn't go, you can't go to AWS and just and find it. I ended up having to go through several, several locations to, uh, to finally get a hold of it. And it's, uh, it's essentially just all it is is a, is a cloud formation template. Once you find the link to it, the S3 bucket, and run it, it, it works just fine. Um, but effectively, that's what it looks like in design mode. So you find the script, uh, you go to the cloud formation in, in AWS, uh, you create a new stack, paste in the name of the location of your script, click next, answer some question, and then go away for a while. That's what it takes in order to set up the four core accounts. And when they say GUI, GUI is, is again, kind of a little bit of a misnomer, but that's what it looks like. Uh, you go through, you create your stack, you find your pointer on the bottom left, and then you go through and answer some questions as far as what are the email addresses that need to be attached to each one of the accounts, um, and some information about the organization itself, some names and whatnot, and it just goes off and does it. When it gets done, then you've got, if you go into your organizations and look, you've got three accounts now. You've got a shared services account, a security account, and a log archive account, just like we talked about. Um, and if you can see, I can't tell, I don't know if you do or not, but the, the emails down below them um, are just a little bit different. They're all my email address with a little plus um, comment on it for each individual one. So it's just like when you create a new AWS account, you start getting emails for, hey, here's how awesome AWS is. Each one of these will start getting those as well. Um, so effectively, that's what it does. It just basically sets up accounts for you like you normally would have. But the cool thing is all the things that it does for you in the background. So on the right-hand side is a list of all the resources it creates. So there's was it 57 IAM roles. I've got uh, 15 CloudFormation stacks, a whole bunch of alarms, some policies out there for IAM, um, including password policies and a, a couple of buckets and so forth. So these all get created for you and connected up. And plus they automatically are set to run whenever something changes, like new accounts come into play. Here's the stack sets that it has, it's just some additional things that it, it creates out there for you. And then a whole bunch of other templates that it creates, uh, and one of which is the landing, or the, um, the account vending machine, which we'll discuss in a second. So all this stuff is done for you, it's all, it's all source code, and if I could just jump over here real quick, hopefully this won't blow things. Any, uh, any cloud formation people out there? No? Terraform? Yeah. Heat? No heat? I really need to rethink my career direction. <laughs> Let's see if I can just get the source code up here for a second. Okay. And it's, it's an eye chart for me too, but essentially the, uh, the initialization template for landing zone um, at the top is the, the, the GUI portion of it. We're asking you the questions and putting some, um, some quality control in the data that you enter. And then it's 5,000 lines of just stuff that it goes out and creates and sets up the linkages for. Um, and that's just a, a really cool thing. Um, but again, it's just a template. You can modify it for whatever you want. Um, I did some basic modification just to change some, some options for me and, and so forth. Uh, but it's, and just rerun it and it just picks it up just fine. Um, it's uh, idempotent, idempotent. However, whichever way you say that, um, the, the script that you run, we won't, it won't mess with anything that you've already done. Uh, it'll just add to it. And then the, uh, the template for, or the script for creating vending machine accounts is the same kind of thing. Instead of 5,000 lines, I think it's only, you know, 500, 600 lines or so. Okay. Oh. That was a fail on the presenter's part. Okay, so that was the results. Um, future modifications. You can make changes to this. Some things are not hooked up. So if you go to make changes into your, your environment uh, as far as the script goes, it won't necessarily put those into the organization units on the organization side. Um, that's sometimes, that's, you have to go through and make sure that those get, uh, get synced up after you do this. But for the most part, any objects you create after you do landing zone, like say new accounts, new tables, new S3 buckets and things of that nature, all the rules that are set up for them will take effect if there's rules for them uh, to begin with. The scripts are ident identipotent, identipotent, thank you. Um, and then be prepared to spend a lot of time configuring and testing your setup. 
because um, again, the 5,000 lines you saw of the, of the cloud formation script is just a tip of the iceberg, and it's also a very generic way to put it together. All right, so vending an account um, is one of those scripts that it created, and it looks very similar. Uh, in this case, I'm creating a, um, an account for Star Trek uh, over here with the, um, this person and I'm putting them in the Star Trek organization. And then when I get it done, it will show up next to Skippy and Joe Bishop uh, over here uh, as well. So it's just a, a quick way to kind of go off and do an account. And it's, it gets automatically all of their, um, all of the, the security that you need and uh, access control rights are already all there. This is what the account looks like uh, when you set it up and you log into it. Uh, it does delete the root access keys. If you want to have MFA um, and create individual users within that, you could. You just have to add it to the script. But you'll notice up here, um, it's got roles of 25 roles that are set up there automatically. Um, those are the things that it's allowed to do based upon the security baseline that was created when you did the, uh, the initial um, uh, control panel. And then the, uh, the default password, I, you know, if you want to do a, uh, you can change this as well, but it gives you a default password uh, policy as well. So you don't have to worry about that. When it gives you an account, it's done. All right, and then some of the, uh, the back and forth with this on the, the, uh, the trusted entities on the, back and, uh, on the right hand side is how the accounts that it creates connect to each other. This is how it can talk to logging by default and how the security has access to it by default. Uh, all those interactions are just governed for you and, and set up. So um, a, couple, a couple more things. The, uh, the multi, multiple account facilitation, there's a couple more things that a AWS puts in place so that you can actually make it a little bit easier to, to work with multiple accounts. Uh, one of which is called the Resource Access Manager. So you can share internet gateways, uh, some networking things as well. So you don't necessarily have to recreate assets in each individual account in order to have them be utilized by everybody becomes wasteful. So you have the ability then to, to share these things across uh, accounts and you manage it through the, the RAM. And then VPC sharing is something that's relatively new. Uh, I think a couple months, um, essentially what this lets you do is you can share, you can take a network and you can share subnets across different accounts uh, as well. So if you wanted to uh, maybe make things a little bit more accessible as far as like clustered environments and things like that, you could do that too. All right, the fun stuff, cost and availability. Um, as with most things with Amazon, it, it doesn't cost anything for, except for the things that it uses underneath. So the actual using of, 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 of this is free, but it's not free. Um, <clears throat> so the, I had a heart attack <laughs> when, I, when I launched this for the very first time. Um, I go out there and I set it up and I, I get the thing running and it goes and it takes a couple hours sometimes for all the things to go through and permeate uh, that it needs to build. And I come back and I check my, um, my usage from zero, 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 40 to five dollars. And that was within an hour and a half of, of me launching this thing. So in my simple mind, I extrapolated it. It's like, all right, I've got some time to get this presentation done and I've got to deliver this, this thing. Um, so I'm looking at a, at a $2,000 you know, bill for this thing. This is gonna be horrible. Um, I was actually gonna think, I was gonna call Star Trek and say like, I'm gonna have to cancel this because this, this product sucks. There's no way I would ever recommend this to anybody. Um, luckily, it was just during the creation phase, and config rules are charged on the each, whereas most other things are charged by, you know, number of bytes, number of, of uh, transaction processes, and so forth. Um, but config rules are actually charged by the each, and it sets up like about 30, 40 of them right away, like boom. Um, when you start going past that, and the, the things you can see up here, config and uh, EC2 costs and, and the catalog cost and the taxes, that was the top four costs that I had after running this for a few hours. And this is what it ends up being. Everything else was like pittance. Um, if I extrapolated it out, so there was my one, my one hour, and then my, my four days, and then after eight days, it's, it's kind of leveling off. The, the bump you see at the end of four days is going out and actually getting the vending machine to create some additional accounts for me so I could test it and see how it worked and, and all those things. So when it does that, it obviously it creates more config roles uh, or rules for it. And then uh, it adds, you get the corresponding cost for this. So as you can probably tell, if you're in an active environment and you're actively managing these things and you've got people coming in and leaving and all the things that go along with that, then your costs are gonna fluctuate and they're probably more on the higher side. Um, what the recommendations and the, the, the things that they've been seeing are is if you leave it at default settings and really don't do anything with it, aside from you know, a few accounts here and there, you're gonna pay roughly $200 a month. Uh, if you attach it to your AD connection, um, for SSO, then it's gonna be about 340 a month, and then for, if you're doing elk logging, as an example, it's roughly around $400 a month. 
Um, don't know if, if this is a lot of you know, back and forth trying to tweak things and figure things out, which is why one of the reasons why they say you should probably bring in AWS uh, professional services to help you because they actually have free accounts that they can you know, do a lot of this testing on um, as opposed to you trying to test it and end up spending thousands of dollars and just monkeying around trying to get the, um, the, the wording right on your, um, your prompts. Um, but, uh, but essentially this is the cost of, of executing it over the course of a month and then you have to figure out is that greater or less than what it costs me to go through and, and painstakingly deal with keeping up with rules and, and everything else that goes along with it. So availability, um, like I said before, it's generally available, but keep in mind, um, documentation on it is spotty. Now, I've got a list of things at the end, and I think that, are they making uh, the presentations available to everybody? So I've got like three pages of, of references and links and so forth. Um, but the documentation for official documentation is very spotty at best. A lot of it you're gonna see is just you know, uh, press releases and whatnot. But uh, there's not a lot of Stack Overflow or server fault stuff. You end up having to go through and, and figure things out. If you're already a CloudFormation person, Probably not a problem, um, but some of the stuff is, is very advanced. Um, landing zones, very opinionated, which I get irritated at, at that kind of thing. Um, but uh, in this situation, it, it saves me more time than it costs me. But uh, they, they have a certain way they want to do things. Their best practice is their best practice, and that's what they're going to try to enforce. Obviously, you can update it to be whatever you want it to be, but then you end up having to, to pay the price of making the modifications for it uh, and testing it yourself. Um, Amazon will recommend having a certified partner come in to do it. There was a story that uh, somebody asked to be able to download it and have a certified partner come in, that, uh, or actually a, uh, an Amazon professional services person to come in to do it. This is back in October of last year. And they said, yeah, as soon as we trained them. So at the point in time, they had not fully trained them yet. And they didn't want to send anybody out in the field until they had actually done so. Um, so if you really, really, really want it, I imagine they'll really, really, really help you, but you may have to be, uh, do a lot of stuff on your own. Um, so familiarize yourself with step functions and some of the other more advanced things uh, in there as well. And then control tower will likely preempt landing zones. So once the control tower is in general availability, the GUI that I talked about, then some of this need may go away. However, if you have hardcore needs that you need to, to go through and, and uh, automate, then you probably still want to have help from somebody unless you've got the, the help on site to be able to go through and say, here's the, the rules I want to uh, facilitate and actually use. And that's just a picture of uh, the process that it goes through uh, when it, go and it actually builds landing zones. So it's, there's a lot of things out there. So uh, in summary, um, two things to, to think about is, one thing is that they don't recommend is do not artificially make your organizational structure and your account structure to be exactly like your organizational structure. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, do not make your account structure to be like your organizational structure because your applications may cross boundaries. So you should probably do it more on the, the application boundaries as opposed to the organization boundaries. It might make more, more sense and uh, have less, less crosstalk that way between, um, between accounts that you don't need. And the purpose of this talk was not necessarily to be a commercial for landing zone. Uh, it was more hopefully for the, the need and understanding that multiple accounts actually can be your friend. Uh, and there's ways to do it. You just have to go through the same kind of planning process you do for just about anything else that you do from a strategy standpoint uh, in your applications and your projects before you start. Because once you jump in the middle of it, it may be too late to go back and, and take all those things out or it'd be more costly in order to do so. So it's just more of a think about it before you jump into your Amazon project. And if you've already got some standing stuff that's up there and it's not done the way you want it to do, it doesn't hurt as much to create a new, uh, a new account and set the new one up the same way and then start migrating things over to it. That might be a better answer than trying to retrofit the one you already have. So, that's me. Any questions from anybody? No? John? No? All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, whoops, sorry. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Oh, on the, um, so on, the question was, is on one of the slides I have the delete root account. I can go, probably go back to it. The, um, the best practice that, uh, that Amazon put in place for this is to, if I can pull it up real quick so we can, is it this one? Oh, sorry, I went, went, went too far. All right, so the very first green check up there is delete your root access keys. 
Um, yes, that is one of the things that they recommend doing because what they want you to do is this stays as far as a, a, a user ID and password to get into, uh, but you, if you want to do any kind of user accounts after this, you create separate ones. So when I create a root account, it's just like super user, um, is when I create a root account on Amazon, what they'll, I'll typically do is create another user that I actually have MFA turned on and all those other types of things too. That's the one where I programmatically have access to it, but, uh, and I can, I can specify there at that point all the different access rules I have, because my root account has access to everything. And so I, I still have a user ID and password to it so I can do maintenance on it, but as far as programmatic access to it, like with the access keys here, like the secret key and so forth, they, they typically want you to get rid of that. Yes. Yes, unless you unless you give yourself permission to do that in the, in the account that you created, which you know, six one way hashes and the other. But yeah, but typically just for general people, that's what they typically recommend. And you can change this. I mean, you don't have to necessarily do that. You can change the script to not do that. Anybody else have a question? And if you have a question up here, I, I I'm just looking into the sun, so I can't see. Nope. All right. Thank you very much.